Likewise. All right. Success. All right. Well, once again, thank you. welcome everyone to uh, Seattle, Washington, for our the first uh, first segment of our hybrid interim. Um, what you see there on the slide. I mean, do you want to talk about the moose, Alan? You have a longer history with him. Yeah. So the the local baseball teams, Seattle Mariners, uh, did not have a furry mascot until they had a competition in, I believe, 1990. People submitted many different Northwest themed. Uh, animals and the the moose won the vote so the mariner moose has uh been the mascot since then and uh he's a pretty entertaining guy he rides his atv around the outfield and um you know he can dance it's good you should unfortunately the mariners are not in town this week so you can't see him i can't hear sir does that mean that is going to win just as much as the mariners you know the mariners are in first place right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the uh, both of your MOQ chairs are available for Mariners talk at any break or lunchtime. Um, this concludes the meeting. I think we've covered everything we need to cover. All right, lovely. All right, this this is the note. Well, um, I don't think this is uh, new to anyone, but this covers the intellectual property implications. Of you being here, as well as uh, a code of conduct. If you've not seen it, type this into your favorite search engine um, and uh, read all, read up. Okay, uh, we're um, Al and I are still experimenting a little bit with how these meetings should work, but we're going, to, the chat will be in Zulip, or, it will, or if you like Meet Echo Chat, which is the same thing, where it will be archived. So please have uh, substantive discussions in there. Um, we're gonna use a kind of a weird hybrid queuing mechanism uh, in an effort to optimize discussion flow. So if you are out there remote, please raise your hand and Google Meet. Um, the chairs will be monitoring that. For those of you who are here in the room, just raise your hand like a normal human, um, and we will try to keep that as fair as we can. But we're, we would like to move things along um, a little more organically than maybe happens in a traditional meet echo queue, for instance. Uh, those of you in the room, there are mics floating around. Uh, please make sure you have one before you start talking, because uh, there are no there are no uh, mics to pick up sound in this room besides the mics that are floating around. And we do have a whiteboard um, here at the head of the room. We will, the camera that's currently trained on the chairs will move over there if there's a whiteboard discussion. Uh, we did a little test yesterday and I think it comes across pretty well online. So uh, if we get there, if we start using the whiteboard, uh, hopefully everyone is, is able to, to participate in that. Uh, somebody needs to mute their, mute their, their meet. Someone in this corner. And uh, we'll just wait for Christian to mute. All right. Um, those of you who are remote, again, uh, use Google Meet to raise your hand if you would like to join the queue. And of course, all audio, video, and slides will be here in Meet, which you probably already figured out. OK, this is the agenda for this morning. Um, we're currently in the administrivia phase. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the goals of the interim, uh, quick interop readout, and uh, Alan and I would like to remind you a little bit about rough consensus because there's been some concern that um, we're getting away from the way we should do that. We asked Colin and Alan to put together a presentation sort of laying out the problem space for priorities, just to give everyone a primer to get us a common frame of reference. Then after a short break, uh, we currently have lunch scheduled for 12.30, but there's a bit of a scheduling snafu, so we might have to move that to 11.30. Um, Pacific, I, I'm, I've got a bread going with somebody at facilities to try to sort that out. Ideally, we'd, we'd have lunch at 12.30 here in the building. Um, anyway, around that, there will be a total of four talks, each of 20 minutes by various people that kind of attack different problems associated with priority. They're going in the afternoon, Victor is the last of those talks. And then uh, the chairs are planning to lead a kind of open-ended discussion. Um, there are some notes that are linked there, uh, kind of some some leading questions about what we're trying to do that hopefully, again, give us a little more common ground about what our requirements are, what our goals are. Uh, and then if time allows, we'll discuss proposals. Um, and ideally at 445, we have some ideas that can be turned into PRs tonight for homework by various people. We'll see if we get there. Um, <laughs> our track record is mixed <laughs> on that kind of thing, but we're going to do what we can do. Would anyone like to bash the agenda? 
I do remind you that the focus of this of this entire meeting is priorities and not other stuff. Okay, hearing no bashing, we'll move on. Thank you to, was it Mike? Yes, Mike is our scribe. Uh, I invite you to go to um, the, uh, the the notes tab in our you know, Meet Echo thing. Um, and uh, if you make a statement, uh, please go check Mike's notes and, and make sure that the, the, the spirit of what you said is captured um, because we are not always entirely concise in the way we say things. Um, furthermore, if you are not logged into the Meet Echo, I need you to go into the notes and enter your name at the top in of sort of virtual blue sheet so we can get that correct for attendance purposes. So again, if, if you're in the Meet Echo, you know, actually, let's make this easier. Whether, whether you're in Meet Echo or not, please go into the notes and add your name to the blue sheets so we can just do this in one big thing rather than trying to merge two things. And check if it's already there. We've already added a lot of them. OK, thank you, Colin. All right, so once again, please go into the notes, add your name to the blue sheets. Uh, chat, or unless, you, unless you're running Zulip. Uh, you, I mean, you can run Zulip and not have the weight of Meet Echo if you, if you prefer. We skipped introductions. You want to just do it? One more question. Yeah. Are we going to present on me from our laptops, or are we going to present physically plugged into something up there? Uh, you can feel feel free to do it from your laptop if that, and just sit down. Um, I, I think what we worked out is probably easier for people to sit at their station and like just present that way. And then um, you know, obviously this this the slides will be up here. If you really need to like point, then then that's fine. We can make it work. But the camera situation will be easier if you just sit where you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can zoom the camera around and all that stuff manually. It's kind of slow, weirdly, but, um, you know, for, for a fixed presentation, we can totally zoom in on you or whoever's presenting. All right. Any other questions about that? This this is Spencer. Just one quick thing. Um, I, could hear, I can hear you perfectly, but when people are asking you questions in the room, uh, it's probably good to restate. Uh, I was I was not able to hear uh, the, the the other half of the conversation, and uh, yeah, yes, yeah, Spencer, we, we've, we've already you. like failed to follow the rule about using the mic, um, so we'll get there. It was it was in room logistics, so uh, I'm not going to bother to repeat the conversation, <laughs> but I apologize. We're we're already messing up, so thank you for the reminder. Did I train you guys? Never mind. <laughs> Well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't you talk about the goals? Oh, I was going to maybe just, should we just quickly and do introductions before we do goals? And, or do you want to do goals first? Just, I know a lot of people here know each other, but there are some new faces who may not know us. And and we just want to like, okay, sure. let's everyone run around and just say your name and your affiliation. Keep it brief. Uh, I'm Alan Frindell, Meta. I'm one of the chairs. Martin Duke, Google, the other chair. Just get a microphone and pass it around. Uh, Victor Vasilev, Google. Daryl Pogan, Meta. Uh, Luke Curley, Discord. Daniel Fay, Meta. Josh Tran, Discord. Jahed Nokia, and editor. editor. Uh, Ian Sweat, Google, and editor of the MOQT. Uh, so, how's Nandakumar, Cisco? Mozanati, Cisco. Christian Wittema by myself, but uh, I work with Cisco on this project. Colin Jennings, Cisco. Will, <clears throat> excuse me, Will Law Akamai. Mike English, ideas. I'll call people off the meat roster. Ali. Ali Began, Ozean University. Lucas. It's Lucas Pardue from Cloudflare. I think he's muted. It's all right. Mathis. Hi, Mathis Engelbart from Technical University of Munich. Sebastian. We can't hear you, Sebastian. Okay, Sebastian Rust from I don't know where. Um, Spencer? Yeah? Oh, there you are. Go ahead, Sebastian. Sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, Sebastian from the Technical University of Darmstadt. 
Lovely. Spencer? Uh, Spencer Dawkins, uh, Wonder Hamster Inner Networking, and uh, the editor for the, uh, one of the editors for the requirements draft. Thank you. Ted? Uh, Ted Hardy, Cisco, Portugal. Uh, my apologies, I'll be jumping in and off uh, the meeting all day. Tim? Uh, Tim Evans, Cisco, working on MOQ implementation, specifically in C++ using Pico Quick. And Victor Veal. Victor from Tokyo. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, people have had a little time to stare at the goal slide, but um, we kind of broke it down uh, into, into three groups. And uh, I know people have been thinking about priority problems for quite a while, but we want to sort of start, uh, did you just kill my slide? That's okay. That's okay. Anyway, we, the first thing, we, a lot of the mornings gonna be focused on just trying to define what is the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and hopefully we can get some agreement there. And again, um, rough consensus, and that you know, there may be parts of this problem we say we are not gonna solve or things that we are, but we, we need to sort of agree what that is before we have a solution for it. Uh, and then we try to make sure that we have rough consensus on the general approach. And then hopefully by tomorrow, we have actually achieved consensus on the language that supports the solution that solves the problem. I don't know if anybody else wants to add additional goals or talk about those goals or that that kind of uh, approach to, to how we're doing things, but um, that's what we've came up with. You know we're talking about interrupt? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, the camera is like strangely. No, that's, oh, that's you. Oh, that's me, ha, yeah. there we go. Um, usually turn on your camera. Is that weird? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Now you can't see me and I'm not confused. Yeah. All right, so uh, we've got, uh, I mean, of our one, two, three, four, five, six implementations, I think everybody but Jordy had a chance to at least start uh, doing draft four. Um, yesterday we got interrupt between uh, Google, uh, Mathis's implementation, um, my implementation, which is called Moxygen, which also went open source over the weekend. Um, and uh, I heard from Cisco, from Suhas this morning that they were able to get some interop going with, with Mathis. Uh, I think it was, I think they said successful. So we're, we're moving along uh, in that direction, which is good. Uh, I will say, at least for those of us who interrupt yesterday, it was primarily on sort of the more minor changes in the draft for, which were changing the parameters for subscribe, which I personally found quite welcome. And, uh, and object status, but we, I don't think people are doing a lot of track status or subscribe update handling or sending yet. So we are people are on draft four, but I don't think we can say that we've tested the full suite of things that are there. Um, I don't know. Anybody want to say anything about interrupt? Jump in. Things that we learned, things that are hard, things that are easy. There was an interesting discussion about subscribe done. Oh, Ian, go ahead. Grab a mic. Is there only one? No, I think they passed one all the way around. So oh. now there's two over at that end. <laughs> Weren't there two other? Uh, other what? There's okay. three of them all right. <laughs> all right. Um, what were the what were the most painful things uh, that you discovered? Like, what were the parts that like were the most hairy and most that enum starts with, at one instead of zero? <laughs> So I mean I, I I mean I I had a lot of trouble with subscribe done and I found an issue to that effect I think on Friday that just the logic I mean it's not as after further discussion it's not as bad as I thought but it's still kind of hairy and uh, to like know when I've gotten when I'm as a relay have I sent everything and can I therefore send a subscribe done and there's just a lot of compromises to make that I had to sort of figure out on my own and the tracking is heinous. Yeah, we, we had a couple of issues. I mean, one of, uh, when you, you look at the, the current draft, it's a tiny bit under-specified. Like, for example, the subscribe update doesn't have a, a number of days appear for that. But the, the big issue is that we end up with uh, having to do trial parsing to get uh, the uh, get the messages from the streams. Yeah, I think Christian and I talked about this yesterday because there's no length for message anymore. 
if you've got some number of bytes, you don't know if you have enough to parse an entire message. So you just have to give it a go. And if you did, you ran it out, you just have to know that that's... It's, it's probably okay, because if you did have a length, you would also need to wait for the length. And and the, uh, the DOS effect are kind of the same. But it's... In one case, you know how long you have to wait. In the other case, you have to see if you try. Yes. I totally but, second that. And, and that is and really it, scary with that. Do you want to say more about why it's scary from a DOS perspective or? Well, the DOS, because you have like a track A list for me to like even, well, first off for me to do a session setup, this is why I mentioned about the timeout, by the way. But when I do a session setup, most of the variables, like anything that is a parameter is variable length. I could read several gigs of data before I even process the connect setup. And it could be totally invalid, but I don't know that. It would be nice if I kind of knew it. And it would be nice if I could somehow jump if I don't want to like process this message, how can I jump to the next one in the in the control stream? I can't. I have to process the whole thing. Jump it. So yeah, that's one of the uh, issue, and the one that compounds it is what's the size of a URI exactly? I, th I think that maybe goes to Tim's point also in terms of if maybe things would be a little easier if we could set maximum lengths yeah. for a few fields yeah. for all the for the variable variable fields. So if, if you if the, whatever URI is, someone says I'm sending you a gigabyte URI, you can just fail immediately or skip yeah. over yeah. a gig, I guess, if that's what you want to do. There's no maxes for anything in this. I mean, there. I mean, there's no max on object length. There's no maximum number of objects per group. There's no max. There's no for max some of the control messages maybe. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just pointing out there right now. I think this is a a topic that's rife for fixing a whole bunch of stuff. Because yeah. right now, I I'm pretty sure that like yeah, you so, could use so, this as an attack vector like very easily. So I am to, to your yeah. point. If there was uh, in the head of someone said that that message will be a gigabyte, the guy who receives that can says, "You must be kidding me," and <laughs> hang the exactly. connection immediately. But right yeah. now, it has to start reading a megabyte and two megabyte and three megabyte and then say. Wow, that guy must be kidding me. So that, that well, not just that, but how do you how do you actually say you're kidding me? It just becomes a protocol error, right? Or we don't even have an error for this to indicate that you're kidding me. You're exceeding what I would consider my maximum value. I have to set a maximum value. I think everybody's gonna have to set a maximum value, but we have no way to convey that or even to air it out. In, in the room, just go ahead and talk. And we're looking at me. Uh, so I think t Tim's point is about control messages. And I would hate to see every single field have a maximum. I think that's fraught with error. Um, if we want to set an overall global control message maximum, but it, it needs to be really big because I, I, I don't think we should, you know, limit it to like, a practical URI length. Some people might say, oh no, that your practical 4K, I, I need a 12K. So I don't think we should limit it to practical things. We should limit it to what's an attack vector. What's what starts to look like an attack vector and limit control messages to that, whatever people think an attack vector is. Yeah, I said, go ahead and Luke and Victor. Testing, okay. Um, so quick deals with similar issues. Quick is variable int encoding. The difference is quick doesn't really have many strings. Honestly, it's mostly var ints. Uh, when quick does have a string, I think connection ID, there is a max length. There's like 200 bytes or something. Um, so we could set some maxes. Um, but even then, you can't, you still have to, when you're writing a decoder, not blindly trust the size. Like don't allocate a gigabyte just because they said there's a gigabyte coming. <laughs> You still have to wait regardless. Um, so I don't think it changes too much, but some maxes would be nice. Well, you have to hash, but you have to hash the track name or some type of track. You have to generate track alias, right? From, from a track name space and a name. I have to read in that whole thing in order to generate that. If I have an internal implementation that says, look, I'm only gonna read in like one meg in size for each value, but you sent me just a little bit over a meg, my hash isn't going to work, especially if you're using that last few bytes to change the difference between your subscriptions. So I have to air it out, but I don't know why it's so difficult to not just tell the during client setup and server setup that says, hey, these are like the max name or max sizes for track name and namespace, which are very important to have accurately. 
that we agree on the full size. Hey, can I ask that somebody file an issue about this if it doesn't exist already? Whether it be Tim yeah. or somebody else. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. All right. I think that's it for slides. I do have an update on the all important schedule. Uh, we are going to have to have lunch at 1130. So I, th I think we're going to bail on the break and just do presentations until 1130 and then go eat. So those of you out there uh, can also adjust your, your breaks and, and lunches accordingly or dinners, wherever, depending on where you may be. So uh, next up, I think, is Cullen, who I can see. Let me stop sharing. Can you guys drive the slides? Yeah. You want to share the slides? Do you want me to share them? Can you share them? Uh, that way I can manage the queue. I just got to find them. Uh, just a quick question for the chairs. Did we cover rough consensus? Oh, oh gosh. Me? Yes, thank you. Uh, while while he's messing with slides, I can yeah. So um, I think an observation that that has uh, that several people have made is that we are get we're getting in fights where people propose a solution to a problem, and other people say I don't have that problem, and like that's okay. That's that's a fine observation, but I, I think at this point we are not necessarily excluding use cases. So uh, I think it's I, I think it, it is perfectly. It is actually valuable to voice that that you don't necessarily share a particular requirement or use case, but at the same time, we are not going to reject PRs because a significant number of people don't have that problem. So the especially valuable kind of objections are: uh, I don't understand what this is achieving. This thing will not achieve what uh, what it says it's going to achieve um, because of some technical problem. Uh, you know, this this PR has it creates an undue burden on people that don't have the the implementation burden on people that don't have this particular use case or requirement, uh, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, to, to the extent that that people want to discuss these PRs, I would like I would especially like to see um, objections of that nature rather than just like I don't care about this problem. Um, and I think in the last virtual interim, we tried to apply that case. We had a PR where a bunch of people thought it wasn't important, but nobody was going to lie down on the road on it. And I, I thought that worked pretty well. So uh, I guess that concludes this PSA. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so are, are you going to sit at your, where are you going to stand? You I think I'm going to stand, stand so I can wave at the slides here. It's more fun. Okay. I will do some camera work. I can do whatever. Um, Okay, so look on this conversation too, I'm trying to just in this session get through like things I've heard that some people want as use cases they think are relative to this and are re relevant to this. And I mean, yeah, you might think they are or they aren't or whatever. Some of these you might think they are solutions, not use cases. I've, I've taken loose comments to heart. We're trying to make them more use case oriented, um, but uh, trying to get us to a common degree of, well, I at least understand what that person's talking about. That, that, that's sort of like the, the key thing. So we'll have to have some people jump on here. So the first slide is probably the biggest one with a ton of different things. We'll spend a bunch of time walking through it. So next slide. Um, okay. So, and some of these we have later slides that nuance a little bit more detail on them. Okay. So the first one's, uh, this is really weird to be like staring up at the ceiling, praying to the, uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a presenter screen here that's really weird to be using. Um, okay, so audio is more important than video. Obviously that's, you know, we, we've discussed that one lots. Um, there's some variants of that a little bit later where like audio far in the future is not possibly more important than video I need really soon. Okay, but the, the, we often hear people talk about, uh, they have a use case where if they're going to lose something due to congestion or, or something else, they want to lose, the audio is more important than video. Makes sense as a way of phrasing that because of that, if you totally disagree with my phrasing of this, you're going to hate all the, everything else I'm going to talk about. So, okay. I, I, I guess my question is, are you trying to say that universally audio, because could, no, could there are also I, use cases where video is more important than audio? 100%. You want, okay. You're just trying just, to say A could be more important than B. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Exactly. And there's certainly ones where the other way, but just like, there's people who want to do that. We probably need a way to express that and all the generalized versions of it and some other variants. So that doesn't make, that doesn't mean these are not like number one overrides number three or anything. These are just things I've heard. <laughs> okay. So um, low bit rate video, more important than high bit radio, uh, you know, sort of the ABR type algorithms. We've seen that in, in many cases. Um, this one is trying to flip it around to be much more specific about one person wants to see Alice over Bob, and the other person wants to see Bob over Alice or something like that. Basically, different subscribers 
desire what the they might want to see both if it's all great but if they can't see both the one that's more important to them which track or, or video is more important to them is is different for different subscribers that's all i'm trying to capture there um obviously right now most of our stuff i don't think any of the implementations i've seen are up with have layered codecs right now exactly um in the in the classic sense of layered codecs but obviously we we think in the future we want to be able to support various types of layered codecs and do things like you know the base layer is more important than the enhancement layers um low-res thumbnails are less important than the main video screen okay so this is um uh, you know this may be a variant of the other ones okay now we start getting into some of the ones a little bit more complicated um video older than it certain short amount of time is not useful to a real-time client because it's already past that point in his play buffer and it's just it's never going to play it so don't deliver anything that's older than i just said 250 milliseconds here but some you know small amount of time so that's one type of use case that has to do with that and i i do believe that this is a um this is very much related to which packet to deliver next because you don't send the packet if it's older than if it's older than 250 milliseconds um there may be more complicated variations we talked about with that where people like if you don't think it's going to get there before 250 milliseconds but it's not to it's it's only you know 200 milliseconds but it won't make it there in 50. Uh, that's a solution space we can explore but it's not the requirement here is just the basic case of um being able to not forward packets that are older than a short amount of time. Now, we have a different sort of use case that sounds almost the same. Uh, this one's from the, the will, which is like, you know, contractually, you know, I want to make, I want to have a way to say, you know, contractually, I'm not allowed to play video that's older than 30 minutes on this uh, live sporting event that I'm streaming into a certain region. And so I need a way to say, don't deliver these packets if they're more than 30 minutes old. Did I get that roughly right? Okay. Uh, Hand up now. A uh, quick, quick clarifying point on that. I think there were two different scenarios that we talked about that are subtly different. One is, uh, you know, publisher hinting that something may not be useful after 30 minutes, and then the other one is like, I have a contract that says on Tuesday I can't serve you this game anymore. Uh, yeah. Okay. We probably should. I should probably should have thresh, separate these out then. So there's there's one like. It's not useful, and I, like the one I always bring up, I don't want to pay for more than thirty minutes of caching on this. So, like, if you keep it around, like you know, it's on you, whatever. But that doesn't meet Will's requirement, which is, like, do not deliver this after <laughs> this date, right? <laughs> yeah. We're getting into cache priorities there, and I, uh, sorry, cache hinting, which I don't think is 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 decoupled from prioritization, correct? Fair, fair enough. And I was trying to keep this on the. Uh, when I say priorities, I mean all the things that impact what packet do i send next <laughs> that's that's how i sort of scope my pro whatever priorities mean for me victor victor yeah i think that's a good example of why like six fits here and seven doesn't really fit because there are really almost no circumstances under which you would send something that's 30 minutes old so like that in real time case unless someone explicitly asks you for it but it's not the real time case it's the behind life yes case. that's what i meant like but like but none, nothing says these are only real-time cases, right? They're just cases that come, and we need to make a solution that accommodates these cases. Some are real-time, yeah, no. some are not. I'll come to look at a second, but I just saw saying, I am also here that we may or may not agree is a valid case for any of this, but at least somebody thinks is important and we should have it in the back of our minds. Okay, Luke. Yeah, at that point, there's really two categories of use cases. This is, I would say, for congestion control, like, Real time, we need to make a decision immediately. What do I send next? The 30 minute stuff, like to, to Victor's point, like it doesn't doesn't matter. Like that's not a congestion control thing. That's just a you know, like a policy. It's just <laughs> to avoid sending redundant data. So I think we it would be nice to also just to kind of bucket these into a don't send useless data and you must send this next, otherwise the user experience will suck. Okay. Makes sense. I think I'm going to verge into more here that might be on the other side of that bucket as we keep going down this list. So um, th this one I struggled how to reduce to a single sentence. But what we came to is video that needs to be played soon is more important than audio far in the future. Now, soon, far in the future being really super vague here. But uh, if you're doing a real-time client and, you know, you 
I, I don't know. I, I think there's the the, the you want me to talk to it? yeah. You want to talk? Just one for so, a second. You got I mean, a mic there. Is, yeah. This is something that we that and we have another slide on this too. So okay, there's I mean, more. Yeah. Just yeah. So we have seen this problem, um, and it's not necessarily a real time case, but you're trying to fetch an audio track and a video track, and if you say something like, "Well, the audio is more important than the video," uh, that's sort of true to a point, but then at some point, your audio. Uh, your your video is what's going to you end up stalling because you don't have that video and your priority said i still audio is more important i have audio to send i'm going to keep sending it and your player is stalling until it gets a chance so like it may be the case that maybe in in the example i'm giving maybe neither nor audio nor video is more important than each other right maybe they have equal importance but i want some notion of like these two tracks have like points in which they I don't want to use synchronization points, but no, some like, some like kind the, of point this, where this, it like it makes yeah. sense to like what if if track A gets to this point, don't deliver any more A until B gets to an equivalent point. So that spawns some hands. Yeah, Kirill could probably talk further to it. Yeah. The comment on that. Basically, like it's kind of depends on player implementation, but like what usually happens there, there is a buffers for audio and video, and there's low high water marks there, and so you. And, and, and they could be different for audio and video. And so like you could have audio and not have video and you can still keep playing, but then at some point you're gonna stop. So that's a concept that I think Alan is trying to explain. And yes, like that, it doesn't mean that audio is more important than video. They're sort of equally important within a sometime window. Right. There's somebody's hand I lost over here. Uh, oh. I think you just leave it on. It doesn't seem to pick up yeah. the room very much. Okay. Um, the way I see, the way I read this, and the way I think about this is that timeliness is more important than anything else. Meaning that, and then when 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 you have to make a decision, if you have a decision to make that either audio or video will get there in time, then you decide that audio will get there in time. If there's enough audio there already, then you send the video to make sure that the video gets there in time. That's really what you're going after here, I think. Yeah, and like, look, we saw like solutions in the original warp that offset the, the priorities in a certain way to achieve that. So there's many solutions to that. I will note, I occasionally run into some of these ones like this one where I'm like, you'll note one of the requirements that's not on here is, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. You, you know, watching CBS news is more important to me than watching Fox news. It's like, well, that's, that's not a priority decision the relay needs to make. Like if you want to watch CPS, like subscribe to CBS. <laughs> if you want to watch Fox or subscribe to Fox, right? So, I mean, some of these may fall into the, you know, that we will we'll need to, as we talk more about these, think about like how much of these are totally a client side decision and, and don't need any, it's not about what the relay sends next. It's purely about the client, you know, what the, obviously the relay won't send stuff the client didn't request. So um, anyway, this one's hard to phrase. I think we're on the same page, what it means. And it's definitely something that's on that should be on our minds in thinking about solutions. Um, okay, fetching older media is less important than subscribing to the live edge. And there's a there's the alternative of this too. But the idea that there's certainly the, the use cases where you know you're playing a live video and you may be prefetching or um, getting some uh, old data so that you can trick play backwards if you want to or something like that, and that's lower priority. We've heard variants of that many times. No, no, okay, I thought I was hands for a second. Yeah. You just you said the and the alternative's true. I think it's good to point it out. If I'm doing VOD playback, it's the exact opposite. Right. I care about the first object and I, I need that first before I can go forward. So it's just an inversion. And we do have the ability to play at the live edge for real time media, but to just want to start it at the beginning for VOD. 100%. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so. These ones uh, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about as well, and I'm sure that some of these people won't agree with or whatever. It doesn't matter. Just like like this is one of the, one of the things that's, that's floating around is um, when we're talking about what gets sent next. It's also what's happening of like what the kernel sends next, what the switches send next, what the whole system is sending next, and um, we there are cases where we want the ability, or there, there are some use cases where you want the ability to 
set the network traffic class to be, you know, expedited forwarding or AF42 or something like that. And perhaps AF41. I mean, in some cases, people want to do AF42 for iframes and AF43 for P-frames. Um, you know, there's, there's some variants of that. And that is also a form of priority and a way of, of changing what's happening on what's getting forwarded next. Some applications use, some applications don't. Closely related to that is what happens on the Wi-Fi network. Um, particularly for low latency stuff, if you can get your Wi-Fi to set the, the, the Wi-Fi priorities to um, voice or video interactive, your number of retransmissions is much lower, your latency is much lower, your scheduling latency is lower, so there, there are various things that happen there and you can recover from errors faster in some cases. The, the generally the Wi-Fi priorities are set by looking at the diff serve classes and then mapping those down to the Wi-Fi classes in the in the Wi-Fi drivers. Um, so that's that's another form that can can drive priority on that. We've got a little bit of slides later on that. Um, questions on those two? Quick question. Um, so that actually works. <laughs> no, I mean so, this is a yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's a very look like. Does it work all the time? Hell no, not a chance. Okay. Um, so I get sort of cases where it does work. So um, like, you know, Apple Cisco released, like if you do the fast lane stuff on Apple's iOS clients, you definitely in environments where that's enabled and turned on, it does make a noticeable difference. Um, but, uh, and we've definitely seen on some of the gaming stuff that on the uplinks out of home broadband routers, that, that one single point, it works, but it turns out that's an important thing. Um, does this stuff flow across the internet as a whole? No, it often gets whited out. Um, it, is there stuff that reads it, decides, oh, that's cute, I'm gonna remark it as something else? Yes. Uh, <laughs> do you have situations where you mark it and the network's like, well, that's nice you marked that, but I'm, not, I'm ignoring you totally. Yeah, that's definitely too. Um, but there's, uh, particularly on the, the sort of uh, local Wi, the, the local network, and on home routers that are uplinking out, there's a fair amount of success of looking at it. Yeah. Okay. As I will say, also you can end up in the um, ultra low uh, low bandwidth voice queue that some carriers have accidentally if you use diff server marks because we've had that happen. Yeah, <laughs> you might be happy about that, or you might not, and. Before we go to the next question, I will say I put the 5G stuff on here that's equivalent because I didn't know enough about it. <laughs> okay, uh, Jahid here. Uh, so this um, 10 and 11, I was thinking like now we're going to down in the network layer. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, up to up to nine, it was like, okay, uh, I'm an application, I can do a lot, lot of things and even the policy of it, obviously. But there you have a bit of like, okay, I'm done here on my job. It is basically you know, on the another layer to deliver and uh, do this up first channel or not and all this. So I was thinking like, if we are making another bucket here uh, on the the priority and uh, some of them is must to happen like the congestion control and all these things. Some of them are policy. Some of them is the good to good to think about. So I'm thinking we're go going to that kind of direction. Yep, totally fair. Totally true. Uh, um. I imagine that we aren't going to be spending a lot of time in this group talking about exactly what gets mapped to what priority classes in the network and so on. But I think it's valuable to think about this when we uh, think or talk about transition control mechanisms for different uh, traffic within a connection. Because if you have different priority markings for different types of traffic flowing in the network, they're effectively following different queues and different paths. And you're going to have a lot of reordering if you don't actually, if you make assumptions about ordering in the network, they're going to get broken here. So it's something to keep in mind. I mean, I have, uh, I think it'd be too much for us to be actually in a place where we specify a controller that works with multiple priority classes, but uh, it might be something to note um, as we work on first implementing this stuff or writing, it's, it's probably worth writing something about this in the mock transport document. Yeah, and hopefully Christian will speak to the issues of this in Quick. Yeah, Quick has a pretty uh, much uh, built-in hypothesis that all packets have the same priority. I mean, it, it, it does. You could get away with a variation of that. I think uh, uh, there's a Cisco draft on that. 
that basically you use multi-paths and one of the paths uses a different priority than the other path. But that's kind of research. So I, I, I think, Karen, that I, I see the interest. There's a lot of practical interest in being able to do that. But I think that as first approximation, we have to take the hypothesis that all quick packets have the same priority unless we are doing research. And, and research will be something that comes into this group when we have research results. That's... I mean, if you rephrase that as all quick packets on the same connection will be the same priority, and I 100% agree. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and we make that. Yeah. Then, then we have to say, a lot of what we do is basically within the same connection in which all the packets have the same priority, which packet do we send now? Which is kind of the the, the, the top line there. Yep. Okay. Yep. Totally fair. But uh, I think we should we should narrow narrow the discussion because otherwise it can get really wide. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh yeah, another problem with marking individual packets as high priority is that the uh, that interacts very poorly with the default loss detection we d discovered. Yeah, that you exactly. yeah, I mean, that's a, so sorry. I just want to make a clarification. I don't want to go into the rabbit hole of actually doing this here. I'm think, I'm saying that the, the group should not go into the rabbit hole like ever because that's not worth doing. I agree with Christian that that's a research question and we should leave it out. However, I think it's important to note that if you're actually going to start marking packets with different priorities within the same connection, it is going to interact with quick congestion control as specified today. And you're going to have to do something different there. That might be worth noting in any document that we write or any implementation that we do. Just, just I, I think I almost thought you heard this. So what, what you said is, I, I might have heard that wrong, but you're saying as soon as in a given quick congestion control context, which is for the connection, you basically can't use different markings. That's that's what you were trying to say, right? In you today's can. quick, yeah, you can. Um, just to be just to be oh, precise yes, you here, can. you can, you can but, but it, you know, it, it will not work how we want it. Correct. Yes, okay, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Okay, agree with that, All right, yep. Uh, just um, to bring it up to a, a, a more practical level, we're only talking about marking, but that's really just one piece. There, the, the reason you have priority is because you have queues somewhere. The reason you have marking is because you have queues somewhere. There are queues in every layer. There's not just a queue in the NIC with a marking on it. There's a queue in every single layer all the way down to the NIC. So I think it's useful for us to understand what all those layers are and what the queuing mechanisms and the priority mechanisms in those layers are. Whether or not they survive the network, I think, you know, is is not as relevant as understanding all the layers and understanding what you should do in order to preserve your priority as far down those layers as you can. Whether they get whitened or something in one of those layers, there's nothing you can do about that. But you should understand all those layers and do whatever the best you can to get your markings all the way down to those layers. More the point we are making is that in a quick connection, if all your packets are not queued the same way, then a bunch of bad stuff are going to happen. Like you all have uh, uh, loss detection will not work, congestion control will be messed up, etc. So the, the, the general hypothesis that uh, I think we should make right now is that for now, we have to make the hypothesis that a quick connection uses a single marking layer for all packets, a single network mark. Because otherwise, quick as it is right now, just doesn't work. Okay, and we can explore. I mean, the exploration of using marking, but these are really research, and we should leave it to research for now. Because if we try to do that and get rough consensus, we'll never succeed. My okay. point wasn't about marking. My point yeah. was that lower layers, the OS itself, the the OS is going to have queues. What do you set your UDP uh, buffer to? for a quick connection. That has practical implications for your congestion control. The layers underneath you are not just the network marking layer at the NIC. There's other layers there that we should make sure we all understand and, and optimize delivery for. So uh, that, that's that's what the quick stack does. Okay. So the quick stack do that and they are very much aware of that. Okay, Spen Sp Spencer's in the queue and we're, we've spent a lot of time on this particular point and there's a bunch, there's several more slides here. So maybe you just think about. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I think we should, we should move on past this point. Okay, Spencer? 
I mean, roughly this slide is half the presentation. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> Tim's a cute so, uh, so, yeah, this is Spencer. I wanted to agree with what's being said so far and basically just a little bit stronger. Um, the, the, the things we're talking about uh, are multi-layer and they are playing with things like that at, at quick is research. Um, the other thing is that we may not, I would, I hope it is true that we are not the right place to do that work. Um, that if basically, if, if basically, uh, if basically research turning into engineering on, you know, in CCWG uh, has an effect on what we do uh, more than just at the API level, that's, that seems like that's going to be very difficult for this stuff to be deployable and to uh, be evolvable. Okay, I, I, I want to just back up here. I, I think I've misrepresented this requirement understanding. The requirement is an application that I think the people who think this is a requirement, the app requirement is an application that was an audio video app, interactive audio video application, like let, 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 let's say like Zoom, would mark all of its traffic EF, period. Not it's marking some of the traffic EF and some of it not EF. I understand it's a research problem. No one was proposing that in the slightest. It was simply there is marking all your traffic EF is what many audio video applications do, right? And there would be other applications like VOD where that would probably not be an optimal experience for them. If you were just doing a VOD experience, you probably would not want to mark. You'd probably get better performance if you didn't mark EF than if you did mark EF. Um, so I, that that's I I think that's all. I, like I totally totally agree. Like I, I don't think anyone's proposed that the you know the changing the congestion controllers in quick so that they could support multiple markings was obviously not something that would be done in this working group or was even being proposed. Right, Tim. Yes, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, so I was going to call out a couple things real quickly. I, I believe Tim, you're a little quiet. Um, if there's any way you can talk louder, uh, can you hear me okay now? Is it better if I talk louder? It's a little bit better. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'll just talk louder. Um, so I believe Datagram should have been fine to be able to do per Datagram markings. Uh, you know, toss markings. I'm not sure why that's an issue with any of the stream related issues. The other thing is, I think. I don't also don't see any issue of why we couldn't do a different pause marking at the connection context level. So I understand that, okay, all streams bundled in one context and it would mess everything up. That makes sense. But why can we not do it at the context level within the single quick connection? Yeah. You can. So Tim, from the room as you can. From Perfect. quick experts. Then, yeah. yeah. Then that's what I would like to explore with ours. If right now, if so Christian's in the room. PicoQuick does not let us do markings per datagram. So certainly would like to see that with most quick stacks. And then also markings setting on a per connection level, which would definitely work for us, I think. Victor, are we getting? Yeah, get, get, can okay. we... closing the queue, but take the let's take these last two, <laughs> Victor. And then... Yeah, marking per datagram is complicated because there can be multiple datagrams in a quick packet. Good point, Luke. That 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 depends on the packing, right? And that depends on the implementation of quick. It doesn't have to pack those same markings together. It couldn't pack them together. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think quick datagrams can use different markings. I think just because sequence reordering, whatever. It's it's. We should just move on. <laughs> so then can we get a connection level? Why? So connection level, at least. Because right now, we're going to have to actually, when I say connection, I mean a connection context within Quick, not the actual five tuple. My fallback is to there's, use another five tuple. There's more important things. So, so uh, Christian says he'll clarify and take this offline. But I, I, I think, like, Christian both seem to see, like, yeah, this is really clear what you can and cannot do. So let's just take that offline and, and follow up on it. OK, we're going to table fair? markings. No more markings. Okay. If you want to talk about markings, go to the chat. Uh, I'm table it for three more points. Um, okay. Uh, so again, some people, this next one, uh, some people said they want to, uh, this is not about markings. We're just back about like which thing the relay forward is next that they'd like to be able to say that some types of frames like I frames are more important than P frames. 
um, slight variant of this, or maybe the same thing, long-term reference frames are more important uh, than other bits of data in that same track is what that 13 should have said. Um, I, 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 those are at least relatively clear whether you agree or just, I mean, I know there's some people who say this is totally useless, this would never make sense. Um, but is at least clear what we're talking about here one way or the other. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I, this 14 one, this has been discussed a bit in some of the conversations on the list or the bugs somewhere, um, that is one of the pro classic problems with many uh, uh, real-time systems, uh, probably all systems, was you want to send a bunch of metrics about how things are going so you can help debug information and figure out why somebody had bad pina quality or where it was. But those metrics themselves often um, are, are using up in the same bandwidth and they're competing against it. And if you send them over their complete unflow, their own, you know, their own TCP connection or something, now they're sharing bandwidth with your media instead of a lower priority than your media. So this has been the suggestion that if you're sending some metrics information over mock, you can put it at a lower priority than your actual media, so it has less impact on it and sort of you know slips in between your iframes type idea. Um, um, yes, no, that's a good idea. Sorry, I actually wanted to twelve real briefly. Oh, great. But okay. I don't want to not interrupt you when you're you're. Sharing. I completely agree with <laughs> you both you said. Um, I, I would say that on twelve, I would make it even more strong that p frames are useless without the relevant iframe and the preceding p frames. Like they literally have zero value, right? So it's not just that they're more. It's not like I should start sending both of them. I mean, that's why people talk about put, putting them on streams is because like they have strictly zero value without the preceding data on that stream, right? I think that's that's where streams are good is like this IP frame relationship where like the subsequent byte has zero value without the preceding byte. Like anytime that's good there, like a stream is your friend. But I do. Yeah, uh, I makes sense. I mean, I I suspect that this discussion comes down to whether the first iframe of the next sequence is more or less important than the last p frame of the previous got I, but look i just I, i'm i'm right I, i'm just writing them down man <laughs> just one use case that related to what you just mentioned is that uh, there are a case in which gulp, like we're assuming that gulps are perfectly adjacent, but they might overlap temporarily. Right. Right. And so that's, that's kind of makes this discussion complicated. Do, do, you, do you want to just explain? I mean, I can, or one of us should explain to everyone what we're talking about here, this type of. Well, one of them is like you might want to start cutting your iframe earlier just so that you're like, to use showing latency or like to have lower bandwidth spike. So, I mean, like we've seen, you know, some systems have done hacks where like smooth sending your fi iframe over like five frames. Okay. So you're going to have a big lag there. But if you wanted to still keep your latencies really d low down, you could keep sending pre frame P frames that were referenced against the previous iframe for those five frames while you were smoothing sending out the iframe at the same time. Now you've upped your bandwidth and you're sending a fifth of the iframe plus a P frame at the same time as you smooth that across, but you can push latencies back. And so some of those, those first five frames ended up, and then you'll have to send P frames for those five frames again, reference to the new iframe. So like there, there's sort of these games you can play to trade off um to, to smooth out your bandwidth and uh sometimes it might make sense to encode things more than once to reduce your latency like that that's the class of stuff you're talking about right yeah okay um uh i think you're on the last one yeah okay there was no comments on the, the media but sorry the metrics like less you know so low, lower are less important than everything else okay 15 um uh this is markings again and it has all the issues again obviously quick context like a, a given quick context can only have one marking in it but you could have multiple contexts or whatever so there has been comments from people that are interested in l4s of like hey be great if the quick stuff worked with l4s we probably are using non-building queues we could probably the applications that we're doing that would be marking all of their traffic as a non-building queue um marking so perhaps some way of doing it uh, I, I, again, I 
don't know that this has anything to do with what packet you send next. So maybe it should be out of scope for today, but I didn't know, so I wrote it down. Um, um, yeah, I think scripting is fine. It's a gimme. Like you, you, know, you, you take it okay. and you and you run with it. But in 12, I would just want to go back to 12 so I understood it. But it doesn't mean that we can't take 12 as a rule, like what you just said, where you might have an iframe, uh, but a, but P frames that are going alongside it encoded against the previous iframe, which tells me that those P frames are probably higher priority. Um, okay, there's. Let me give you something that I don't think is agreement on that maybe answers this question. Um, let's say we're only doing a video, a single video stream. Ignore all audio and different resolutions and everything. Should you send the most recently encoded thing first? Is, is the latest thing the most important thing? Or is the oldest thing the most important thing? I mean, different people, let, like there's been different arguments for that in this group over time for, for various ways. And, you know, if you, one of the questions comes down to is like, if you always mark your iframes as more important than anything else, you're probably fairly likely right when you're on that fringy bandwidth where there's enough bandwidth to play, but not a huge amount, you will probably start losing the last P frame of the previous GOP sequence. Um, so if your metric, and I think that probably one of our best metrics for most cases is the number of frames dropped, right? <laughs> like, you, you know, that sort of impacts the end user experience when you really get right down to it. If you're trying to minimize that, there's probably a lot of cases where you want to send the last P frame in the GOP sequence before you start sending the I frame in the next GOP sequence. On the other hand, if you were way behind, you'd probably skip and go forward. Mo? Uh, so I think maybe a, a clarifying example of this would would make it a lot easier to understand. Um, some some people are using things like the send order or, or the time of a group or an object to prioritize things. If you don't do that, if you're not using time-based prioritization, prioritizing the first object, and let's not even talk about iframes or RP frames, the first object of a group is supposed to be independent, right? It's a synchronization point, it's a, it's a stream join point, and it can even be for things like, you know, for, for text or catalogs or anything else. So the first independent object that comes along, you want to be able to prioritize that because if you're not prioritizing based on time, what's going to happen is the new independent thing comes in and it's a new time, but the time doesn't matter. But you want to be able to say all of the tail of the previous group can be dropped because now I have this this new synchronization point. So it's it's prioritizing synchronization points over the tail of the previous dependent objects. And in Suhas's demo, that's exactly what we were doing, and that's exactly the result that you get when you have that when you have that prioritization. We're not doing time-based prioritization, we're doing iframe based uh, synchronization point. Sorry. Cool. Thanks, Chrome. <laughs> Like I have a feeling that the chairs did this. I have a feeling that the chairs did this to increase the diversity in this room a little bit more. The gender diversity in this room. Continue. Don't fall asleep on the panel. That's anymore. not funny. I'm I'm not trying to be funny. It's a fact. That's what I said. Okay, <laughs> it's it's terrible, but it's okay. Going on, I I um uh I'm still trying to understand how to interpret number twelve. Uh, that iframes are more important. I understand that, and and that's what you just described more, and and what you said as well. But you also gave a counter example where p frames might be sent alongside i frames, where p frames are equally important. I I'm happy to take either one. I'm just asking if we, because if you're going to work with these rules, it's useful to know that 12 is something that we agree is a rule. Sure, sure. So let, let me, before we go around the room, let me try and just answer that and then we'll get back to the question of shutting. I think that the way to phrase this, probably Mo's phrasing of sometimes the first object in the group is more important than, than, than previous groups for many use cases. And probably, which is what 12 was trying to say, there's probably some flip use cases 
where that might not be true. Uh, okay, so going around, I lost um, Luke. I guess I lost count of who's. Uh, just to just to clarify, I think it's what Ian said. Um, you want to uh, frames sometimes have dependencies, and you within the dependency graph you need the priorities to match. So within a GOP, and specifically that's within a GOP. That's not saying all iframes are more important than all P frames. So within a group of picture, which is scoped. The uh, P frames depend on the I, so you always want to deliver the I first. There's never any reason to deliver the P first. Um, that doesn't mean like with, there there are multiple gaps that will be in flight, and then it gets a little messy. But um, we really want to make sure that the the video frame dependency structure um, that the decoder expects matches what's on the network. That close other people's questions too. Or will a, a last one, and I think it's picking up on what. Mo suggested that all these examples are very, very media centric. And to keep us honest, we, we are a binary pub sub protocol, right? So if if I'm like using mock, and this is a use case someone's come to me with of, of rendering 3D worlds and tessellated vertices, I want to render the ones closest to me in proximity and not further away. So that's that's not a metric to do with time or media, but it's still a valid case of prior, prioritization for mock. So we need at least whatever our prioritization scheme shouldn't be tied to media terms, but it should be tied to groups and objects and the notion that there's characteristics of these that we want to be able to prioritize. Cool. Could you try and put that into the chat room or something so it makes it in the notes? I, I missed. It's, it's a good use case, and I should have had it. I just didn't. Oops, miss. Okay. You know, just before we move on to the next slide, does anybody have a case they really like will just add in. Are there any other people who think I, I have a case I'm thinking about, but I don't see on this list. I don't know that we've talked about it. That you want to like offer in. Like it's not specifically related to the case, but what Mills uh, Will's meta point, I think we should capture that. That we, we what are the mechanisms we come out should not be very focused on today's uh, how video is being distributed or done. Uh, I think that's a meta point we should come out and keep in mind where any so, uh, problem we try to solve today. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think I agree. I think just it's also good to have grounding actual use case. Instead of talking about moving groups and objects, people talking about things that we are actually chartered to move around. I mean, there's similar use case, which is to wheels, which is 3D videos, right? So where you want to prioritize things that in your field of view uh, what, as you turn your head around. So it's the same concept. OK, makes sense. Right, right. Prioritize things in the field of view. Okay. Can you and drop that in the notes too, just like a one liner for me, so I, I don't I'm miss it. Yeah. Also curious, are there are there are we so maybe holding aside marking, are there things here people are like, that's wrong, or mock should not concern itself with that? Or do we have at least within the room and on the call, like general that these are the right sets of things to be looking at? Not wrong, but just another example of the difference between the independent and the dependent objects for the 3D use case. When we send game state or or you know player moves or things like that, that's also a case where or any any protocol where you want to send deltas and fulls, that's another case where this 12 makes sense that the full should have priority over the deltas. Uh, just to provide context on that uh, too, um, there's a draft I wrote a while back about game state. It hasn't moved forward in RTP, not in mock, but it's an idea of how to like have the positions of things in 3D worlds and information about game moves or controllers um, transferred over RTP. That's the, the game state we're talking about. And you easily imagine that being used in mock in an AR VR context. And I think just one other comment about the, 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 the iframe P frame within a single GOP. And I think we sort of maybe Luke identified or someone else did just a minute ago is that there's kind of more than one way to solve this, right? You could put every frame in its own stream and then rely on priorities to solve your ordering problem, or you can put it all in the same stream and have quick solve your ordering problem without any priority required. And it's just a lot of these things will have more than one solution, and we should just figure out which ones we're happy with. Some of these are in the doctor, doctor, it hurts, don't do it sort of category. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I want to go on to a couple more slides, which will be much quicker than the previous slide, than this slide. This is the hard slide. Um, that talk into a little bit more detail about deployments and then some of the other sort of a little bit more detail about some of these cases. Fair to move on? And then when you mentioned that you can solve things with priorities in quick, you have to make uh, the point that priority in quick are largely best effort. 
there are plenty of scenarios in which we see priority inversions in Quick. And so, uh, using parity to provide order in presence of parity inversion is kind of uh, acknowledged. <laughs> Okay, so this is a scenario that I just I sort of hinted on the previous slide, but I thought was just worth talking a little bit more explicit detail about th about this use case, um, and explaining what it is. And I, you know, I, I, you know, so we've got a, a a video player, and you know, it might be you know TikTok or something like that. I don't know what. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's playing a video, and that is the most important thing is it wants to make sure it's got some some bandwidth to play the, the video it's talking about. Like, and I'll, and I'll talk about variants of this in a second. Um, but at the same time, it has a high probability prediction of which videos the user might go and start playing next. And that could happen really quickly. And the desirable user experience is be able to change to those new videos super quickly. Um, and like, look, channel switch in traditional VOD has the same problem. There's many people that have a variant of this problem. Right. Um, so what you're doing is you're prefetching the beginning of the next videos, long enough of it that you can just start playing it right away and know that you'll be able to start getting the rest of the buffer before that little prefetched um, stuff happens. And you might, you know, you have your two most likely ones, B and C, that you're trying that the client's trying to prefetch. And uh, when it gets those, then it will move down its probability list to, you know, C and D of ones that are, um, you know, less important. So uh, the 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 issue we're getting at here is the, uh, the, 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 the player client can uh, say that A is more important than other videos, but it was sort of wants to prefetch some other stuff. Can you just jump to the next slide for a second? Let me just remember what it was. Yeah, okay, fine, thanks. <laughs> I forgot whether I need to. So let me stop there. This makes sense as a use case. And this starts to, to blur in the sort of stuff that's playing loosely a live edge or something like that too, um, or, or the current video that you're playing versus a, a, a prefetching other ones. So this is, I don't and know if, from, if your next slide is gonna cover it or not, but yeah. I think it it speaks, playing versus prefetching, this speaking as an individual for meta is, is something where the HTTP priority model, which gives you two choices of exclusive priorities or completely shared priorities, is insufficient to describe what we want to happen. And I'll dig into that okay. on the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is almost the same thing. We come back to the slide at this. So um, let's say the video A playing in that case, you could have 4K or 1080p. Um, but uh, if you had, if you play the 4K video, it uses 100% of the bandwidth and there's no way to prefetch anything. So if you had strict priorities here, you, you'd end up not prefetching anything and you'd have 4K video, but the channel switch experience would be crap. Or alternative, or alternatively, if you played the 1080p stream, you'd have plenty of bandwidth to go do the prefetches. And so the, the requirement here is sometimes, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the solution Alan's looking for is some way to manage to get some of the bandwidth to be used for prefetch and some of the bandwidth to be used for, for the mainstream is the sort of solution space he's going to. But the user experience requirement here is there's cases where you'd rather have the stream playing be lower quality, be 1080p instead of 4K and have fast channel switch than, um, than have the higher quality video. I, maybe Kirill, you can, since you know this way better than I do. Yeah. Uh -oh. And there's definitely cases that would benefit be like that, but there are also cases that not, not like that. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. So um, yeah, uh, I think the at least in our examples, right? So we generally actually like we do prefetch first and then and actually end up playing stuff. So for majority of the things, and so we we do prefetch as we are playing, but it's like it usually less important than like the the very first prefetch and we when we prefetch we, it doesn't mean that we prefetch just one video we prefetch like multiple Lots. videos right yeah. at the same time yeah i was gonna clarify um the priority of prefetch is based on the buffer size so if you have almost no data in the current buffer you don't want the user sitting there spinning while you're prefetching the next video um and the, and vice versa if you have 10 seconds 15 seconds for the current video that they're watching then you can start allocating more the prefetch. So I see that some percentage of bandwidth 
that sounds like a weight. That sounds like you know round robin them, and I don't think that's the best user experience. I think it's really based on the current buffer size, and VOD deals with this a lot. Eventually, you know, the VOD buffer is full. There's no point fetching more VOD. Like, do something else instead. Uh, yeah. So I think this is more buffer size based priority. If, if that's and, an and, overgeneralization. And, and I mean, I was trying to just stick to the use case and not be on like, yeah, a lot of this can be solved by the the end client knows what it's received, knows what bit rate it. it knows it wasn't getting enough bandwidth on the, the 4K to do any prefetch. So maybe it switches to any. Like there's a lot of questions on this of how much of the solution is uh, receiver side versus center side, right? So um, Christian. Yeah, I was going to say that. I mean, we, we are specif specifying a binary protocol. We, I, I don't think we want to be uh, loading a Python program in the relay to execute what the uh, publisher says. I mean, it, we have to have some simple mechanism. Now we have a tendency to think that if we have, if we are using priority, they are static. But a lot of what we could do here is make sure the priority can be dynamic and say, hey, at this point, I, the publisher, or I, the subscriber, says, I would prefer C A at 1080p, which is basically track X, rather than track Z because I want to also have track Y at the same time. And you can do that if your priorities are dynamic and you change them based on what you have got so far and things like that. So it could be done, for example, in the JavaScript in the client, in your case. I mean, that, that, there are many things like that that can be done. And uh, in order for the protocol design, uh, I would try to keep the relaying simple and put the uh, application level logic in the client or in the server and have ways to dynamically alter the priorities or whatever so that it fits. Look, look, that makes total sense. And like, you know, adaptive bitrate video, as we all know it in the HLS or Dash or something is a great example of that, right? It didn't require something on the other side. So I was just trying to, um, you know, Alan had raised this case as being important to him. I wanted to make sure we understood the, the user experience he was trying to accomplish. And then we can figure out what that is the implication into the relay as we go on. Uh, I think next slide. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the deployments and where the congestion happens and where things go wrong because I think that this is one of the things where there's a lot of people coming from very different viewpoints that are thinking about things differently and maybe not realizing it. So obviously the main sort of use case that we often think about this in, in the group when I hear people talking about it is, you know, they're thinking about distribution side and they're thinking about you know an in subscriber at somebody's home or somebody's business or whatever uh, and the the publishers up in the cloud and the mock relay is also up in the cloud might be you know deployed at sort of the classic locations you might see a cdn today and the congestion is between the the last the the, the re, it's it's between the last hop relay or between the mock relay and the the end subscriber is where you're having congestion problems on your DSL line or broadband or your you know whatever it is cellular connection, right? Makes sense. I think everyone's got that one no problem, right? Okay, next one. So, uh, I, you know, I am deeply interested in the use cases where there is actually a relay on premise as well. Okay, and one of the reasons why is because uh, a large percentage of bad audio video connections we see, the problem is actually the Wi-Fi connection, not the um, not necessarily the broadband or the WAN connection. And uh, having the in subscriber very close to the relay makes, re you know, the, re the, the RTT is so short that requesting retransmissions because something got messed up on the Wi-Fi is extremely quick recovery. So. This, you know, having a local relay in that tapes is, um, and, and, you know, I imagine those being built into Wi-Fi access points, home routers, uh, various enterprise access points, so those types of areas. Now, so in this case, you can still have the congestion on the broadband link, same as we had in the previous case, but the, the case here is it's, it's in the relay network a little bit, which is somewhat out of scope for the group, but it can happen on either side of a relay, sort of my point on this. Okay, next slide. Can I just ask a quick question oh, yeah, sure. about this one, which is, um, in the home relay, I assume that you could have that relay is not sort of a, a proxy acting on behalf of maybe a single subscriber, but rather there could be many. You only have one subscriber. Yeah, in your yeah, home, yeah. But there everybody could be, be using one. If it was maybe any, end yeah. subscribers or people, you know, yeah. 
different subscribers to different broadcasts entirely. To different applications. Yeah, I have different applications. Okay, so it's 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 a full it's a it's, full it's mock a, relay. It's just closer to the. It's just on the other side of this congestion, I guess, is the only point. Right. right. And look, okay. we haven't discussed in mock about how to auto discover those or something, but I mean, we use MDNS as you would obviously guess. And, you know, it, the idea is that Relay might be serving both Zoom and WebEx and, you know, three other things for three different users, right? That's that sort of idea. Luke. Yeah, I'm just gonna clarify, this is also for cross cloud. So if you're doing multiple cloud providers mm -hmm. and you wanna somebody ingest with Google and serve with Akamai, we, we, we have, have a lossy thing. connection between Relays. And, and one more so a couple of use cases that came is like when you want to set up something like this a distribution system within a factory floor where uh, there's a real local relay there and they want uh, some kind of survival thing or there there also the case would happen and other cases is in uh, enterprise uh, cases where you have this floor like this uh, they can be relay per floor and that connects to the cloud relay and those uh, use cases are becoming more na natural with mock nowadays i, I would I think you generalize in the bottom bullet, but the top bullet is very specific. All I would, the title is very specific. I mean to say, I, I don't think of this as home relay, just relay to relay, right? So effectively, I don't um, know what I was thinking. That title's crap. I think, it, yeah. No, right. but it's, 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 it's relay, relay, to relay. There are lots of cases because if you're building a relay inside of an ISP, for example, um, and you have a mock relay that's sitting in the cloud, then peering congestion is definitely a part of the same equation here. So there's yeah. plenty of use cases. Yeah, maybe the same point as Jonah. There's, there's, I don't know if you have more slides coming, but there's a lot of that publisher can be outside the cloud, so it's got a DSL connection publishing in. That's slide. a real problem for congestion. Let me and then the within next. the cloud, unfortunately, there is still lots of congestion. There's lots of connectivity, but there's also terabits of traffic. So at every node, basically, we have congestion. I have two more slides, okay. and that you're my best yes man. This is perfect. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. Let's talk about this next one for a second. This is the next. You just covered the thing. Oh no, this one is a little bit different. Uh, the only thing that's here is the losses on the Wi-Fi side of the link versus the broadband side of the link, um, and. Uh, this is one of the cases where if you were doing a voice application and you'd marked everything in a way that allowed the Wi-Fi to apply priorities, you may get some good some benefits from that. And if that relay knew to add EF markings for that traffic on what goes up the DSL line, you may get some good benefits as well. But, but primarily this was just to show that the 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 losses and the congestion could have happened on what I labeled the DSL link here or whether I lab labeled the Wi-Fi link. And um, in today's deployments, it's often very hard to tell which one of those two it is. And the strategies you want to compensate for them are slightly different. So next slide. OK, this gets to Will's first one, not his second one, which is, hey, on the publisher side, the publisher um, I should have put it in a home box here too. I'm looking at this slide now wondering like, why did I, yeah, I anyway, I, I don't know. So the publisher's on a home network and it's, um, you know, up linking to something and like there's there's congestion on that side. Um, and we we have all the sort of same problems that, that can happen there and, and what you do. Um, and of course, whatever, we, whatever happens between that publisher and that first hop Sorry, I'm I'm going to say or, or, original publisher. I'm trying to get with the right terminology here. The between the original publisher and that first mock relay um, affects everyone that's downstream too, right? Because the relay can only send what it gets. So, um, you know, that's that's sort of the realities of that one. So that's that's uh, another place. Um, and then the last one is speaks to this sort of you know relay to relay in the cloud. So. Example I'm giving here, like, so for my house in Calgary, you know, I'm, I'm talking to somebody that's uh, in Bali, we're probably going to go through a relay in Jakarta, let's say. Now, one of the things that's been very common with media traffic through the years, it gets called media steering, there's many different names of it, but it might turn out that the direct link that you might get if you just use BGP uh, from Calgary to Jakarta um, might take you through, through a path that was crappy. Um, where if you steered your traffic specifically through a relay in Singapore, and then th then from there it got forwarded on just charter, you might get a much better experience. And I'm not saying the protocol, this is the type of stuff that would be done well above this protocol, but this will be something that will be done commonly in, in moving data between these types of relays and how that policy and the, that type of routing information is sort of 
done. And this, this is sort of assumes that maybe it's the same provider providing both of those relays or all of those relays. Um, you trade off that data quite often based on quality and cost, and sometimes priority is used to decide uh, some a small amount of my data I'm willing to put on a more expensive path, but maybe my bulk data I might not be willing to put on an expensive path, um, and so that this comes back into priority discussions, but it's a pretty common deployment scenario. Does this make sense, first of all? Just trying to make sure that I understand this right. In this particular case, is the expectation that the um, the the relay in Calgary and the relay in Jakarta are the ones that are going to figure out the multiple paths between the two relays. Yeah, or the 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 service that, that you know, the CDN provider that operates all of those three relays. Um, the three relays. The, the Jakarta Calgary, relay, Singapore, sorry, the Jakarta. Singapore, the Jakarta, and the Calgary relay. That that those would be, let's say, one operator that is doing clever things to figure out how to do stuff like that. But, the, but you're saying that the protocol has to have mechanisms for us to be able to switch between these relays. I'm not, I think we're fine with that. I think, we're, I think we do. I don't think that's an issue. What I'm saying is the when you're trying to make those policy decisions, you often want to know something about the importance of the traffic in deciding which ones to run, which ones you forward through, which portions of the traffic you forward through Singapore and which portions you don't. And that often gets, priorities are often used for helping make that policy decision. And I'm, I'm being pretty wishy-washy here. I'm not saying this is necessarily priorities. I'm just saying this is a deployment that exists and it does relate to existence. There's question. a question, Lucas. Lucas, we can't hear you if you're talking. Yeah, let me slide you up after this thing. I, I think that's basically it. Go one more for a second. Okay. okay. Yeah. This is the last slide. How are we on time? Uh, I'd like to wrap up the next 10 minutes or so if we could. Okay. Lucas, do we have you? Hello? Yep. Just talk a little yeah. louder. Yeah, um, sorry about that. I'll figure it out before I present. Uh, I just want to say, Cullen, this this slide makes total sense to me. Like, it, the operators are going to do whatever they want to do to provide the best kind of end-to-end -end thing. And, and effectively, this is a form of traffic management. That's how I would like to think of it. Um, whether anyone else needs to know about that beyond the people who operate the relays, either side of Singapore in your example, I don't think so. But we should be allowing them um, some ability to see signals and uh make decisions because if we don't they will anyway and they'll use heuristics or sniffing or other sorts of annoying things yeah 100 percent agree traffic management is a great thing of it and we're not trying to solve traffic management we're trying to make sure there is enough signals they can do it without breaking everything <laughs> okay yeah i was gonna uh Asked, I was wondering if this actually imposed new requirements on MOQ, and I think my answer was probably no, but yes, of course, people are going to do this, right? Like, although low latency live is commonly given different treatment from, you know, VOD, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, just a clarification question. I mean, so what you're saying, like, with current MOQT. Do we have those things available to the mock relay? Because we have certain amount of information available to the mock relays, right? So you're saying like that's not adequate for whatever. Or like uh, we have we don't have anything and we don't have any way of expressing that to the relays also. I mean, my my view of this right now is um it, if we had a numeric publisher priority that went into the things and I'm, that's i'm not saying there's any consensus on that but if we had something like that it would fully it would be totally usable for this that's what they're used to using for this type of stuff but if we didn't have anything that looked sort of like the look and smell of publisher priority um then we might have to indicate some other information that allowed this type of thing to happen so my guess is is that we my, my guess of how the conversation will go is this will just fall out of whatever we're doing for other reasons, and we won't actually even have to think about this much. We're going to get it for free, but we need to hear the back one. So there, there have been many discussions of that for the last uh, 40 years or so. Yep. And there is a constant in these discussions is that the network operators definitely do not want the edges to tell them which path the packet will use. 
Yep. And the other odd thing on that is everyone keeps doing it. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, you, you, no, no. When I say, for example, yeah, I, I take, uh, say, Cloudflare or Fastly or one of those. If I tell them, I want this pass to go through your load in Berlin and then your load in London and then your load in New York, no. they'll say, thank you very much. It's a good idea. Let me do what I want. Right. So basically, what we have is to express the data that is used by them to make the decisions, but certainly not express a decision as part of the protocol. Got it. Right. Yeah. 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 That, I, yeah. Makes sense. Um, just to bring this to mock requirements, um, which I think was Jed's uh, question. Um, so clearly, um, these priority signals need to be in the object headers because we we, we need. We need relays to participate. We need, I think, we need consensus that the relays have to operate on these priorities. So it has to go somewhere that's visible to the risk. Can't be in the manifest or the catalog, for example. So, it, has, it has to be in the live data, whether it's per object or per track or whatever. We can discuss. Well, I'm not even going to say where that's controller data, but I'm, it has to be in the visible relay visible, visible field. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that, that that's easy. And then the, the second uh, major thing I got was. Um, Clearly, problems can happen anywhere. Um, and John was saying that, okay, maybe networks can manage their own problems and shield the application from knowing about those problems. But I think you also highlighted some cases where do we, as a protocol, need to be able to signal you know, anomalies in the stream so that the, the, that the receiver that's not participating in that bottleneck isn't confused or doesn't do a bad action because of a lack of a signal. Something happened in the middle, and and I and I lost you know this group. I don't want to take a bad action further downstream, and I downspeed my my downstream because its connection is fine um, because of something else. So we need to think about how far do we need to preserve those signals? Do they propagate, or do they just stay local to that connection? I see what you're saying. I don't have any idea what the answer is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, were any last. We must be down to two minutes here. Any well, last little thing? Let me thing? just maybe ask a clarifying question what Mo just said. Are you saying one of the decisions we need to make is are these signals hop by hop or end to end? I mean, is that another way of saying do, what you're Do we saying? need any end to end priority signal? Uh, is, is there any, or maybe not even priority, you know, is, is um, because of the priority, you, you drop something because it was, you know, it gets it gets entangled with the TTL and delivery order and uh, d delivery time and all that stuff too. Um, but it's all they're all prioritization mechanisms. And do you need to tell downstream connections um, about the decision that you made that would prevent them from making a, a bad decision or conflicting with your decision? Uh, let's go, Will, and then I'll go around. Yeah, to answer Mo's question, I think what the use case Cullen just mentioned of or original publisher priorities, those have to perpetuate down the hops, right? They, they should go right down the chain to the end. But there's other subscriber preferences that can can apply only per hop. So I think we have a mixture of both. I, I think we're going to end up like with a solution on the way Will's thinking about this. So, yeah, but that's into the solution space. I didn't mean. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying to recollect what happened in all the slides and, and all the use cases that you went through. And it, it definitely looks like I agree with uh, some of the discussions here. Each, uh, th there is some use cases where subscriber wants certain way things to be delivered, and some use cases where uh, things might have things might go wrong in every hop that I can I could see in this diagram there. And and what happens when things go wrong? Which uh, as Mo was pointing out, like how do how do we tell the downstream about uh, is something coming or not coming, or can you expect something to come or not? I think whatever solution we come up with have to think about you know not just uh, the one thing is what as a subscriber i would prefer i want versus if things go wrong um how do we communicate or at least indicate something went wrong and also a thing about um, if nothing is asked by subscriber what how should we tell the relays in what order things should be delivered so some, some on sender priority some on subscriber preference and some on indicating when things go wrong uh, i think those are kind of three categories of things that we need to think about in overall solution I agree with what Will said, I think, fun, at, at a high level. But one thing to keep in mind is that these are not end-to-end -end, uh, connections. So the negotiation of priority, if there is one, 
between subscriber and provider will publisher will happen at different points along the way so a relay that has to handle a subs a hundred subs oh, a subscriber and a publisher's priorities will handle will have to negotiate those priorities but if there's a relay that has a relay on this side and a publisher on the other side will be handling priorities differently i think that's all right uh, i just want to make sure that my my thinking about this is correct i mean i think that we are going to probably have people discussing solutions where some of the solutions only apply between the last relay and the in and the in subscriber and then I think we'll we'll have people discussing about solutions where where information, um, you, you know, propagates end to end uh, uh, effectively, and and how to combine those two solutions simultaneously is like one of the you know one of the topics that we'll definitely be talking about, right? Um, because these use cases, or sorry, the use cases I had on slide one, I think if you think through your head on them, you will realize they're. There's some that are directly contradictory with um, with, with only the, the publisher being able to set all of the information that's needed. And there's some that are directly contradictory with only the subscribers being able to do it. So I think we will end up with some combination of these two if we're going to meet all of those or we will be axing off some of those, one or the other. Right. Lucas, you get the last word. Hello. I think my other mic's working. Um, so I, just to pick up on Jana's last point, like effectively what he's saying, if I was to replay it, was um, you're going to have like something in the middle taking priorities or, or data from various people with different values potentially and having to figure this out for different people. Um, and, and that's basically what HTTP has to do today already. All of the different clients request things slightly differently, um, but on the back end, we're generally talking to the same origin server, which might have an opinion or not about things. And we're going to throw in our own opinion and, and a bit of scheduling. So it's it's a deployment model that, that works. Obviously, Mock has its own requirements, which we'll figure out this week. But it, it seems totally feasible to me. Like Nothing worries me about that. It's not necessarily super easy. Um, and some people might not even be bothered and just pick the lowest common denominator. But um, it seems totally doable. Let's give our AD the last word. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my, my view is that kind of kind of what Lucas said. Like here, my view is like nobody knows everything. So we need to share some information in a, some way that everybody has something to make a decision based on that information. That's That's like where we're heading to. So yeah, nothing worries me right now, but uh, it'd be a lively discussion, I guess, in the future. Okay, thank you All very right. much. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, that was a good discussion. So do you want to make an announcement about lunch, or what's the story? Oh, no, so lunch is in 20 minutes, which means we have time for Alan's presentation, which is the next thing on the agenda. Okay. All right. May not even make the whole 20 minutes. What priorities can and can't do. Yeah, hold on. Um, I'm going to scooch a little closer here unless you're, unless it's uncomfortable for you. Okay. Um, so I've been working with priority, specifically HTTP priority for a very long time, uh, at Meta trying to figure out how to, well, as soon as they're in speedy or even H2, trying to figure out how we could use this to deliver application wins. And after spending a lot of time working on that, I had written this document, um, internally called priority manifesto because teams would come and say, Hey, I found this priority field in HTTP. Like we're going to use it to get these wins. And I had to kind of give them some rules of engagement uh, about what you, what you can and can't do uh, with priorities and, and what they're for. So this is starting from the HTTP version, but I try to like add a little bit of mock annotation as things like change. Um, so the first thing that we like to think about when we're doing it is that the resource that you're prioritizing is the bandwidth that the bottleneck link um, you can use priorities for a bunch of other things. You could use them to tell the compute tier how, if it, you know, how much resources to give it the, your request, but that's not what we use them for. Like these just feed into um, scheduling decisions. Uh, and for us, the bottleneck link is we, we almost exclusively treat it as the client to edge link. And uh, I'm sorry, can you use a mic? I can't hear you. So, so mock connection of the walk 
of the world unite. M mock connections of the oh it, you're, <laughs> yes you have nothing to lose but I don't know I'm sure. <laughs> um, so uh, the second thing that is is very true for us and it, it's not clear how this is going to play into MOQ in quite the same way but in, for HTTP we say you can't prioritize well across connections. That's basically done by your kernel or intermediate switches and routers. And if you really want to prioritize traffic A over traffic B, you want to coalesce those into the same connection. So historically, Facebook and other meta properties have had a separate VIP, for example, for images and for videos. And if you're like, well, I really want images to have higher priority than videos, well, guess what? You can't do that. Like, or if you, and dynamic traffic goes to yet another VIP and sometimes in a totally different location and you also can't really prioritize that. Or I want to make a real-time call in the foreground while the app is doing stuff in the background. Like when you scatter things out, you can't do it. So I, I guess the MOQ annotation I added here was that um, I'm, maybe we agree, like prioritizing across different MOQ connections is is out of scope. We're only talking about what can we prioritize within a single MOQ connection yes. or session. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that has to be like a totally different working group. <laughs> sure. If for other reasons a mock application decides to make multiple connections, are we saying that it's also out of scope to be able to prioritize among those multiple connections? I mean, I guess what we're saying is that there's no. We are not going to be able to identify a mechanism in MOQT, for example, to say how you can prioritize connection A over connection B. I guess unless we're talking about the sort of connection marking business, right? Where you can say, oh, this this connection to this relay is going to get marked A, and this connection to that relay is going to be marked B. But that also seems like it's out of MOQT, really. It's more about lower layers. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, no, I wasn't thinking about marking, but just in general, I expect most MOQ apps to have multiple connections, certainly they're probably not going to put their uh, non-media app traffic in the connection, in the same quick connection, right? It's probably going to be even to different destinations. You know, so you can use web transport for that stuff, and then no, I'm just kidding. Right. So, so, but, but, so I'll, I'll say in my talk, but one, one of the pitfalls today is failure to understand the cross traffic. Um, and so, you know, being able to have some mechanism or not close the door on a mechanism where a single application, not coordination among applications, but a single application that knows it's opening these multiple connections can somehow effectively manage the delivery across those connections. Yeah, Christian. Well, uh, I, I have a goal, a personal goal, to say that best effort is good enough. And if we strive to make best effort good enough on the internet, that implies things, uh, selecting congestion control algorithms that don't build queues, that uh, implies uh, doing a, a AQM at the right places, etc. Then you get to the point where best effort is good enough and all these things matter much less. And I think that's the nirvana we should be aiming for. That will simplify things a lot. I, I, are you say, you're, you're saying that we should not need to prioritize across connections? Yeah, exactly. You need to prioritize all. No, you see, no, 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 no. You do need to prioritize. When you have a connection, basically, you can think that, suppose that your bottleneck, they have implemented fair queuing. Okay, so that connection gets a share so that nobody gets more share than the other ones and, and they are there. Then you, the, the problem you have to solve is, okay, I know what share the network is giving me. And I know that because my congestion controller going senses that that's one with I have. And then my problem is, how do I use that in the best way? How do I use that in the best way? It means that I'm going to make selection between the various streams that I'm sending. But I, I think what, what this is trying to say is that if you want something other than fair, yeah. you have to do it yourself. Yeah. You can't ask some equal. equal. OK, yeah, all right. Yes, no, Will. Yeah, I, I agree with the can't prioritize across connections. And I think we may need to take it even further than that, that within a connection, you cannot prioritize across namespaces. The reason being that namespace that we have, if we have any sort of relative prioritization scheme, publishers can use different numbers. So a namespace is a guarantee that your track names are unique, but it's also a guarantee that your prioritization is consistent within your namespace. 
So I think it make we may have to contemplate the idea that we restrict to prioritization I, to and, namespace. Before we go to Luke, I'd maybe just say, do you mean publisher priorities can't go across namespaces? Publisher but, priorities. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah, okay. So Here. two different people publishing on a different namespace. Yeah. So I just forgot to get what is a namespace? Like a broadcast. It's like yeah. Like a no, no, the, the no, 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 no. What, what? I'm going to answer that question because those are wrong answers. Okay. Well, well, we have on, a thing, on, a on, a thing called. So, so the question is, what is a namespace? Yeah. Since people could not hear we it. We should be good at answering yeah. this. So the, the question is, what is a namespace? Um, we have a thing called every track has a full track name. And the track name consists of two tuples one called the namespace, the other called the track name. And it is just a prefix like to that. And but any meeting beyond that is not part of the protocol, it's purely domain and it, you know fucked right like that's yeah luke the, you want to the, the main restriction is there's one publisher for a namespace so no it is i totally no. disagree with that that is oh, okay, wrong okay. well for routing reasons you no, route via that the is namespace. wrong <laughs> okay. no okay. Okay. As that is wrong chair and presenter i'm going to cut this one off um <laughs> Uh, we'll we'll take the namespace thing under advisement later. But Luke, did you have something that's not really? Yeah, this is for for Will's thing. Um, one of the use cases is having a a conference mm -hmm. call with multiple namespaces from different people on the call, like Alice, Bob, whatever. We do want to prioritize between them. We do want to make sure that Alice's audio is higher priority than Bob's video. So to publish your priorities, that's one of the limitations. You need to be within the same namespace to to choose a publisher priority, right? You need to have agree in a priority scheme. But it would be nice if we could have different bro uh, broadcasters that don't necessarily agree, but still able to subscribe and prioritize between them. OK, I'm going to just keep rolling through my manifesto, and then this can get spicy over lunch. How about that? Oh, I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think the priority should really be at the per track alias, because when you publish an object or you send an object, there's no namespace or name in there it's just the alias and that's what we're using to look up this stuff from the relay perspective and that's where we would honor the priority as we do propagate this through all the other relays okay uh thanks i'm gonna keep rolling and um talk about some more like high level things but then we, i'm sure we'll dive into these things later um okay third piece you can only prioritize if you have more than one thing to send um, people get confused all the time. They set priorities on HTTP and they're like, how come it didn't get any faster? And then we look and we're like, oh, well, when you're sending stuff, your queue is always exactly one. It does not matter what you set the priority to. And this is like often baffling to people. But in, I guess the other way is like, if you don't have any congestion, you priorities are effectively meaningless. We'll just, you'll get stuff, you'll send stuff and, and that's all you can do. Um, there was another comment earlier in the other discussion that Mo made, and I wanted to just highlight it, and I think maybe this is a good time to do so, which is about where you prioritize, where prioritization is applied relative to where you are queuing, right? So, and I think H2 is a good example of where this was wrong. There's a bunch of queuing that happens in your kernel, and H2 is prioritizing an application space, and so you might commit something to the kernel too soon and lose the ability to reprioritize even before that data leaves your computer. And so one of the things that we see, one of the reasons why we HTTP three priorities are much more successful is that quick gives us an opportunity to prioritize just in time. So we have it on the correct side of the queue um, so that we can have more than one thing to send and make a make an informed decision. Um, another one is that prioritization is a zero sum game. If you want them to actually have an effect, uh, that means something got faster, but something else got slower in HTTP and the, the mock modification is, maybe it got slower, but maybe it got less reliable, right? We, you said A was more important than B, and so we didn't deliver B, and then B hit a delivery timeout, and it never got there at all. Um, but you can't, it's not free. Um, if everyone sets priority one, nothing happens, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah. I forgot to bring this up when Colin was talking about requirements, but one requirement that came into my mind was lower than best effort as a possibility and if if we number our priority system such that the default is always the lowest um it makes it very difficult to go back and add a scavenger or lower than best um priority and there's a lot of cases where an application would want something to be background uh you know uh background loading or something like that and if we don't design a priority system right from the beginning it's almost impossible to add that scavenger class later okay that's good to know um 
So um, this is one, and so prioritization, prioritization is only as effective as the input signal. Um, and by input signal, I mean, you know, it, whether it's being signaled by a publisher or by a subscriber, but do you know what you actually want? And can you communicate, do you, do you have the tools to communicate that effectively to whoever's gonna actually apply these things? And this was another failure, I think, of H2, and I, maybe, I hope I'm not stealing Lucas's thunder um, for his presentation later, but you know, it was super hard for people to figure out how to map what they wanted to come, the order of the bits they wanted into constructing an HTTP2 tree. And so they just didn't bother. Um, and so uh, that's why I say like capturing the, the signal is the hardest part. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that whatever we come up with, the easiest part will be writing the priority queue. And the hardest part will be making sure that applications that are using this actually specify the priority of the thing that they want in such a way that they get the user experience that they want. Um, and then I have this one, which is reprioritization has a has a penalty, a latency penalty, and it limits its effectiveness. And that came up a little bit earlier in the previous discussion about, oh, can you just like, don't make the relay do that, make the client change its mind and update the priorities. And so that's definitely a possibility, but you do have to, it's not, the, the, the sender may have already sent um, and filled up the pipe with things that are now low priority before that reprioritization or unsubscribe or any other control message um, cancellation like might might get there. Um, yeah, go ahead, Victor. I, I guess by a I assume by reprioritization here you mean reprioritization by the peer. Yes, because I mean, if the sender can decide to reprioritize unilaterally, it is instantaneous. Yes, actually, yeah, peer, that's probably would have been a better way to describe it. Peer reprioritization um, has a penalty. Christian? Well, in practice, prioritization is deciding what will be sent for your bottleneck. And the state of your bottleneck is always known at least one RTT after it changes. if not two, and in most cases it's two. If not cases, it's at least two. You could, in theory, make it just one. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you take the normal thing end to end, it goes from one end of the connection to the other end for the bottleneck and the signal comes back. That's yeah. at least one RTT, and in most cases, it takes two because you are doing deltas. And, and so, half an RTT is not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Lou. Yeah, I just I think this is a good point and kind of why we're writing priorities on the wire in the first place. Like otherwise you could just immediately reprioritize constantly on the receiver side, which is something we have to do on the HLS dash side and it's kind of annoying. Um mostly because the sender is usually in charge of transmitting and congest control and priorities uh, putting the receiver in charge, yeah, you're right. Like you could have the receiver detect congestion and immediately resubscribe. That would be one way of doing priorities, right? Like immediately switch the your unsubscribe to the video when you detect congestion. Um, but I do think the reason we have this scheme is 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 let, let the sender know ahead of time what's gonna ha what it should do if there's sudden congestion. Um, so I do think that prioritization schemes should mostly focus on sudden congestion like what to do immediately. If we have multiple RTTs to make a decision, that's when resubscribing feels more correct to me. So uh, a clarification point, I would say that, well, it's not a question, it's a statement, it's more a comment. I think what you want to say really here is that reprioritization has a latency penalty. Yeah, that's probably That's more about fair. all you want to say, because the problem is, again, when you talk about multiple RTTs and so on, it's not just a question of how long does it take for you once you reprioritize for the signal to reach the sender, which is obviously half RTT. Yeah. But then you have to figure out if you should reprioritize. The detection takes longer, because then you're using all kinds of <laughs> filters on the signals you're receiving and yada, 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 and making predictions about the future and stuff like that. But yes, it definitely is a penalty to reprioritizing, which does limit its effectiveness. Sure. Uh, Victor? Uh, there are two things. That you, I'm not sure is the first one will be in the future slide, but you can. This is the last slide. Okay, it definitely the, won't be in a future slide. Okay, so reprioritization <laughs> can only reprioritize things that will be sent in the future. Mm -hmm. it, 
it is unfortunately cannot represent things mm -hmm. that already sent. <laughs> so uh, there is a there is a bit of like uh, opportunity cost in sending now that you cannot send later things. Uh, yeah, many people think you can. Uh, and the other interesting one for quick is that uh, that as uh, the retransmissions usually always take priority over new data, even if you'd prefer that new data is more important in some cases. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, there, there's, I think there's language. That, that, that is not actually true. Uh, many stacks treat repartization, uh, retransmission at the same priority that was used for the transmission. So retransmission of video doesn't take priority over retransmission of our transmission of audio, for example. Uh, I believe that is true if you follow the shoots in RFC 9000. And there was like an open issue on Web Transport API spec where we discussed this. And the answer was that it's possible to change, but uh, the pitfall of uh, uh, Reaper downgrading retransmission downgrading priority of retransmissions is that you risk running out of uh, your flow control windows because you have things. Yeah. What you say is right within a stream, between stream it is not. Yeah. Yeah, I thought our stack did this until Victor convinced me that it apparently doesn't. Um, so. I, what I was going to say was almost the same thing as Victor start with, which was was like I, I think at this point you're trying to make here is you can't change the priority of something that's you know in flight um, that's on the wire. Well, and yeah. I think John had captured it, which yeah. is, forget about the how many how long the penalty yeah. is, but there is a delay. There's a delay, and right. Right. Uh, yeah. that, that means, and I think also goes to what Luke was saying was that like if you want a faster reaction, you have to have given the information to the sender in advance. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, and, and then just on the, the the other topic, I mean, like y y you know, how the quick stacks deal with that might be a quality of implementation point of view. But I would say that it's certainly advantageous to the type of how we're imagining using them in mock if they are capable of doing retransmissions of the same priority as the original um, stuff. I, I think I mean we can talk about that later, but that seems like a pretty solid topic if they work better that way. Uh, I was just going to make one more point on the side, which I didn't say earlier. Maybe people read it and it was fine, but yep, the publisher, if, at least we don't currently have an accident for the publisher to change the priority of an object. I guess maybe we might need one. Um, but if we, in the way it's currently written, the publisher sends the object once it has priority in it, and that is it for all time. I have a question. What would that, what does that mean? Like, I'm, I'm just like, I mean, this is all a Fano network that's sort of like data is like flowing from the publisher to the subscribers. And so like you, it's it's sort of like a one way. I, I think of- That's like, all this I was trying like, to say. It's this like is, a one way This is graph. one way, yeah. Okay. But if you change the priority, then I don't know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm saying that at least based on the system that we've designed, there doesn't seem to be a way for that to happen. And I mean, wanted this, to, just wanted to make sure people saw that. We're gonna close the queue, but go ahead, John. What I want to say is that the signaling of priorities is one thing and the interpretation of priorities is another thing, right? So it, this doesn't mean that a relay that receives these priority signals from various publishers or from this publisher doesn't make different decisions based on other signals it might be receiving from subscribers as well. But what this says is that once you stamp something with a certain priority, you can't change it. Because I had that queue closed. Yes, uh, uh, so thanks for doing this. I think this is a good, 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 representation of what priority could be. But I, I miss my favorite, like priority is best effort. So, I mean, oh. the yeah, so that that's basically what I said. Like you can set all the priorities, all these things, and the, down the path, it might have effect. It might not have, have any effect on what you, you're, you know, the people are getting in the outside, other side of the town, right? So that's basically, I think, should be also their design principle here. Okay. Uh, this concludes the morning session. Once again, thank you to Mike English for taking the minutes. Uh, come claim your chocolate at your leisure. And you can show your gratitude by volunteering to take the minutes for the afternoon session. Um, so for those of you who are remote, we'll reconvene in one hour. We have a new Meet Echo and a new Google Meet link. Um, are you sure the Meet Echo will have rolled over by one hour from now?
Yeah, oh, I changed. I changed it. Oh. Um, okay, so worst case, we'll put it in the Slack because me and Echo is actually serving no purpose at the Zulip at this point. Um, so. Uh, if for some reason Meet Echo is failing us, then find it in the Slack, but it should be in the Meet Echo, the Google Meet link. Um, Ian and or Victor, can you take the group up to six for lunch while I troubleshoot some camera issues here? And I will join you shortly. Again, we will reconvene in one hour. Thanks, everybody. And we will see you in six zero minutes. Is Zulip and Slack uh, sync or no? No, there's no relationship between Zulip and Slack. Oh. Actually, it's, it's, that I know of. As people head to this meal, I forgot I need to make an announcement about dinner, which is that we have a reservation uh, at a sushi place, uh, I think for 15, and I could maybe make it more. So um, 